So let's start with the boxes. So each box represents an individual study. And the size of the box represents the size of that individual study. So the bigger the box, the bigger the power of the study. So the larger the number of patients involved in that study. So study one had the largest number of patients and study three had the smallest number of patients. Then the second thing to look at is how far the box is from that line of no effect. And one thing to note is that in this particular forest plot, the x-axis is representing a change in calcium. So the line of no effect is zero. But in some cases, you might get odds ratios or risk ratios reported along this x-axis here. And if you do, then the line of no effect might be crossing one vertically rather than zero. And that's because if you remember, a risk ratio or an odds ratio result of one means that there's no difference in the event occurring between the group studied. So don't let that confuse you. And if you see that the line of no effect is crossing one rather than zero, then just check the label of your axis because it should be reporting odds ratios or risk ratios, for example. Now, a positive skew also has some properties that you need to remember. And in this case, the mean is greater than the median, which is greater than the mode. And the way that I remember this is by drawing three vertical lines through my curve. So I remember that the mode is most, and we learned this little mnemonic in the chapter on data types and basic principles. And therefore, because the mode is most, it's represented by the line that goes through the peak of my curve. Then I remember that the median goes in the middle, because the median always goes in the middle, it's the middle value. So the median is represented by this line here between the other two lines. And therefore the mean is the line that's closest to the tail, because if you remember the previous chapter on basic principles, we said that the mean is most affected by outliers, so it's been pulled towards those outliers here, towards the tail end of the curve. So let's start with cohort studies, and these are usually prospective, so we're going forward. So we take two cohorts, follow them up going forward and see what happens in the future. So for example, you have a cohort of people who eat salt, and you have another cohort of people who don't eat salt, and you follow them up to see who develops hypertension. So because you have an exposed and an unexposed group, so eating salt and not eating salt, it's like having a control group. But it's different to a case control study, which we'll talk about in a second, because we are following these patients up prospectively. And you can try and match other attributes in your cohorts, such as age and gender, to try and reduce any confounding factors which could influence your results. And you only use standard deviation in a normally distributed set of data. So any question about standard deviation in a skewed set of data is not really valid. Also, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Now, don't get too bogged down with variance. It's another measure to describe the spread of data from the mean in your data set. So standard deviation is the square root of variance, and variance is the square of standard deviation. So they're both describing dispersion from the mean in slightly different ways, but ultimately, they're trying to say the same thing. So if we look back at the questions, 100 people had an antibiotic for epistaxis, so 83 of them would have got better irrespective of whether they had the antibiotic or not. So these are the green smileys who would have done well even if we hadn't given them any treatment. Then five improved because of the antibiotic itself, and these are our yellow smiley faces. Ten didn't improve despite being given an antibiotic, so we tried to improve the nosebleed by treating them with an antibiotic, but it made no difference, and these are our reds. And two actually got better, so their nosebleed stopped, but they developed a rash from the antibiotic that we gave them, so they had an adverse reaction to the treatment we gave them. So these are our greens with crosses going through them. So how many people had a bad outcome? Well, that would be 12, because it's the 10 reds plus the two greens with crosses. And then I have the exposed or experimental group here and the control group here. So then I fill in the boxes and we were told that 100 people had the new operation and 100 had the old operation. So we can put 100 in each total box for each group.
So these would be the ones who had the new operation, so they're in the experimental group. And these are the ones that had the old operation, so they're in the control group. We're then told that one person who had the new operation had post-op paralysis, so that's the event. So that one person goes here in the event box for the experimental group and five people who had the old operation had the event. So they go here in this box, in the event box next to the control group. So the answer is B and we're going to go through all this in a second, but let's start with analysing our graph. So we have years after surgery along the x-axis here and the survival probability as a percentage along the y-axis, so from 100% at the start of the study and decreasing over time. And women are the top line here, with men being the dotted line underneath. Now, another thing that you might see on these graphs sometimes are small vertical lines going through the steps. And these represent what we call a censored observation which is when data about the event of interest is incomplete for a particular patient and the survival time for that patient cannot really be determined. So for example, if someone is lost to follow up and the more patient data you lose, the less accurate your data becomes. But on this graph here, we haven't got any sensor data because we can't see any little vertical lines along our steps. So now we look at the odds of being exposed to the gas in the cases and the odds of being exposed to the gas in the control group. So for those with lung cancer, the odds of being exposed to the gas is A divided by B, so 100 divided by 900. Then for those without lung cancer, so the controls, the odds of being exposed to the gas are 25 divided by 975, so C divided by D. So then your odds ratio would be the odds in your experimental group divided by the odds in your control group. So you would do A divided by B divided by C divided by D. Then if we have two separate groups of patients, so let's say that we take one group of patients and check their cholesterol levels after three months of being on a statin, and we take another group of patients and we check their cholesterol levels after three months of being on placebo, we would then need an unpaired t-test. And that's because we have two different groups of patients here. Now, if we're looking at more than two samples, we could use an analysis of variance test known as an ANOVA test. So if, for instance, we were measuring cholesterol levels in four different ethnic groups, we could use an ANOVA test here. And if we're looking to demonstrate correlation between two variables, so whether there's a significant association between them, so let's say, for example, we're looking at weight and height. So we want to know whether a change in one variable, so weight, would influence a change in another variable, so height. Then you can use a Pearson's product moment correlation test. So a null hypothesis is the hypothesis that there is no difference between the two groups being compared. So it assumes that all results are due to chance, and it's usually the opposite of what we're trying to investigate in our study. So an example of a null hypothesis would be that high sugar intake is not related to developing a high BMI. Then a type 1 error, which is also known as alpha, is when we incorrectly reject a null hypothesis when it's actually true. So we reject the null hypothesis when in actual fact we should be accepting it. And because we're rejecting the null, we end up with a false positive. So recall bias is where participants base their answers on things they remember from the past, which can lead to bias if their recollections are inaccurate or incomplete, or if they've had certain past experiences influencing the way that they recall information. So for example, if you're doing interviews and asking patients about their own experience of using a certain medication, for example, they may recall friends or relatives having had bad experiences with that medication, which may become clouded with their own memory of using the medication, and it may affect how they remember and then report their own experiences back to you.